Hello and welcome to this session of the massively open online course on digital currencies by the University of Nicosia. I'm your host, Andreas Antonopoulos, and I'll be answering questions that you submitted over the past week and a half in the forums, as well as answer live questions that you might have during this session uh, for follow-up. If you want to ask a question, please submit it using the Google Plus uh, YouTube comment or Hangouts questions feature, and I will try to answer your questions um, as we go through this. So in this session, um, we had a lot of discussion about uh, alternative chains, alternative currencies, and naturally many of the questions are about a couple of the interesting alternative chains and their impact on Bitcoin and the ecosystem as a whole. Let's uh, start with Timothy. Uh, this is a, a, a big question with lots of parts. So let's see if I can answer it in sequence. Timothy says, okay, I think I understand that the purpose of Ether is as fuel for the Ethereum virtual machine, and the developers are downplaying its use as a currency, but it is still a cryptocurrency which can be exchanged for real value. It has very fast confirmation times. It is current second only to Bitcoin and market capitalization, and I understand it is more scalable than Bitcoin by design. Is there anything about Ether which intrinsically makes it unsuitable to be used as a general purpose currency for commerce? Do you think there is any significant possibility that Ether or Ethereum could overtake Bitcoin in the race to mass adoption? Um, this is a question I get very often, and uh, I have to say that I uh, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, which means that. I don't necessarily believe that Bitcoin is the one and only cryptocurrency and all others pale in comparison. I think this is about choice and an open market where people can learn and apply the best technology. However, having said that, I think Bitcoin has a compelling advantage as an early starter, as well as having a great network effect. Now, the question is, um, how does it compare to something like Ethereum? I'm also interested in Ethereum, and I think it is a uh, very interesting innovation used primarily for smart contracts. And uh, I've been involved in uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum from the very earliest days of each of these. Uh, actually, I was involved in Ethereum earlier than I was involved in uh, Bitcoin, at least in its development stage. And. Um, <clears throat> So let's go to Timothy's first question. Is there anything about Ether which makes it unsuitable to be used as a general purpose currency for commerce? Um, no, no, there isn't. There isn't anything about Ether which intrinsically makes it unsuitable to be used as a general purpose currency for commerce. Um, however, that is not its design. Its design is as a, a platform for smart contracts. Now, I look at the ecosystem of cryptocurrencies as a very large environment, which has many different uh, environmental niches, if you like. And I think that um, different currencies, different chains, different altcoins, altchains, um, uh, and, and you know, I count Bitcoin as an altcoin uh, as well, different coins, all of the alternatives that exist out there. Uh, fit in different environmental niches. Now, one of the really important aspects of uh, evolution in biology, from my understanding of it as a layperson at least, is that uh, generally speaking, when um, a species specializes in one environmental niche, that by definition makes it less fit and less adapted for other environmental niches. So, uh, specializing in one area. Uh, remove specialization from other areas. And what I think we see a, a lot of the same phenomena occurring in the competition for the broader environment of digital currencies and currency platforms um, with aspects of specialization. So from that perspective, uh, one of the comparisons I've offered is that, uh, in many ways, Bitcoin and Ethereum are specializing in two different directions. They're trying to adapt to two different environments and becoming specialists in two different environments. 
Now, that doesn't mean that one is superior to the other or inferior to the other, but that question is meaningless without the context. Which is better depends on what, uh, better at what. Uh, so what is the context in which you're trying to use it? Now, I would, uh, I believe that Bitcoin has specialized in the area of less complexity, uh, very scarce monetary policy, and um, high levels of security. So it's designed to be a very strong reserve currency style store value and uh, means of exchange for currency in a way that restricts its use um, and makes it less flexible because it's specialized in that way. The scripting language is conservative. It's designed to be Turing incomplete on purpose. And um, generally speaking, its consensus mechanism is very, very strong, and it is very difficult to change and adapt it. And this results in some challenges in some ways. Um, and it means that Bitcoin is very well suited to be a robust currency as uh, a reserve currency, perhaps, for many other types of systems. Ethereum is designed and specialized for smart contracts. One of its major differences is that Ethereum carries state. Uh, Bitcoin is a stateless system. Um, it has states only in terms of the blockchain as a long-term uh, record of ownership. But Ethereum uh, has, in addition to that, state within contracts. Contracts carry variables that carry state with them. And so there's a, a much more complex mechanisms for achieving consensus in the state of contracts uh, and the values they hold within them. This makes Ethereum specialized and suited for smart contracts. The power of a Turing complete language and the ability to carry state within the contracts makes it extremely versatile and very useful for building uh, complex smart contracts. But in doing so, Ethereum also becomes more complex in its consensus rules, more complex in its execution, uh, and more complex in the number of simply moving parts that are, that are part of Ethereum. And you can see that in a number of uh, areas, such as, for example, the distinction between gas and ether, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and this may, in turn, make Ethereum less suitable to be a robust reserve currency. Um, I think that specializing in one area uh, means that uh, automatically you have to not be as special in another area. Um, very rarely can you find something that is special in, in two areas simultaneously. So, um, you know, think of another analogy would be um, what is to, to ask what is better, a sports car or an all-terrain vehicle? And um, the, the question really depends on whether you're driving uh, on an oval NASCAR track or a Formula One track, or if you're driving through a forest. And if you try to take uh, a Formula One car through a forest, it's going to probably go less than a meter before it uh, uh, collapses in a heap. Um, and if you try to take an all-terrain vehicle around the Formula One track, it's going to be very, very slow. And, and so what is it best for depends on what the context is. And just like you can't make really a car that is simultaneously Formula One and all-terrain, um, because the compromises you make to, to do one thing uh, make you unsuitable for doing the other thing and vice versa. And so from that perspective, I think Ethereum makes certain compromises in its design that make it very suitable for smart contracts. And Bitcoin makes uh, certain compromises that make it very suitable for robust, high security, um, simplified uh, consensus mechanism uh, for a reserve currency and a very strong currency function. Um, and another analogy would be as if uh, Bitcoin is a lion and Ethereum is a shark. You know, both of them are the apex predators. Uh, they're the, the peak at fitness and adaptiveness in their own specific environment. But if you take a shark and you put it in the, um, in the tundra or in the plains, 
um, it's going to have some trouble breathing. And if you take a lot and then you put it under water, it's also going to have some trouble breathing. So even though each is um, an apex in its own domain, uh, is ideally suited and evolved to fit in that domain and deliver uh, with enormous success on its evolutionary imperatives, uh, that doesn't mean they're competing. And, and even if uh, sometimes there is some overlap, uh, which you might think, for example, there is some overlap between current, the currency function uh, of Ethereum and the, and the currency function of Bitcoin. In fact, um, I think that that overlap is is not particularly strong, and the specialization of each makes that quite distinct. So, do I think there's a significant possibility that Ether could over take Bitcoin in the race to mass adoption, and then the question becomes, mass adoption has what? Mass adoption is a smart contract platform? Yes, Ether will overtake Bitcoin, uh, probably, in the race to mass adoption as a smart contracts platform, and Bitcoin will probably overtake Ether in the race to mass adoption as a currency platform. And In fact, the two have very strong ties together. Uh, because if you have a smart contracts platform, it's most useful if you can tie it to a very strong reserve currency. And if you have a strong reserve currency, it's, it's even more useful if you can tie it to a versatile smart contracts platform. So I don't see them as competitors. Um, the add-on question uh, to this is by Jeremy. And, uh, Jeremy says, is gas used for Ethereum transactions adjustable according to Ether price? Um, some say that a higher ETH price or Ether price will impact negatively the network, as gas costs will be too high. But some say gas could be reduced to remain constant and low, even if uh, the price of Ether rises. Um, so this is exactly why gas is implemented. Gas creates um, a secondary uh, currency system, essentially, that has an exchange rate to Ether uh, that allows network fees to be based in gas uh, and not Ether, so that the network fees can float independently of the price of Ether. Um, and, and this gives a, a degree of flexibility, a significant degree of flexibility to the system, but comes at the cost of complexity, because that means there are two independent variables, and they have uh, quite complex interactions with one another. <clears throat> the exchange rate of gas in ether uh, is uh, recalculated by the miners uh, so as to create an upper limit of uh, block scale within ether blocks, as well as uh, control the price of network fees. Uh, and therefore, it dynamically adjusts, and arguably, if the price of ether rises, um, the exchange rate to gas will fall in order to rebalance things. Uh, so that's exactly why gas is is in there. It's designed to to offer an independent variable that can be tweaked by the miners. Now, I'm not entirely sure on the details. I'd have to look these up. But um, similar to the way difficulty is recalculated within. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, gas is recalculated based on a consensus mechanism among the miners um, at certain intervals. I'm not sure what the intervals are. I'd have to look that up. But uh, so the the exchange rate of gas to ether changes over time. Um, I believe at the moment uh, that each of the releases of the first release frontier, the second release homestead, changed uh, a couple of things. The, uh, around gas, uh, specifically the gas limit, how much gas can be put into a single block, which is a scaling issue. Uh, but the, the gas exchange rate, on the other hand, is calculated dynamically. Um, Let's see. Auden asks, 
The developers of Counterparty have moved on to creating a smart contracts platform in the same manner that Ethereum has with compatible contracts. Can you elaborate on what this means? What is the advantage of Ethereum when compared to the platforms that Counterparty and Rootstock are developing? What are the limitations of these platforms when compared to Ethereum? Will the mentioned companies have central control over the systems and platforms? These are all great questions. It's actually very difficult to answer these questions because um, Oh, one side of this question, which refers to Ethereum, refers to a system that is already built and is in production use today um, with Homestead. Um, and the other refers to two platforms, Counterparty and Rootstock, uh, or actually the next generation of Counterparty and the first generation of Rootstock, that are still in the early design stage. And I believe one of them is still in the white paper stage. Um, I don't think it's fair to make comparisons between something that runs uh, and something that is still just an idea. Uh, but I will discuss kind of the idea of smart contracts built on top of Bitcoin. This has been the primary question since the inception of Bitcoin and the first altcoins emerged, um, with IX coin and Litecoin and Namecoin and others uh, forking the Bitcoin code to provide alternatives. And the primary a uh, question for developers of alternative systems is, um, can you generate enough interest in your chain in order to uh, have enough mining or uh, stake or other mechanism of consensus with enough strength to resist attacks? Uh, can you basically bootstrap a level of security to protect your alt chain or alt coin um, by creating enough interest with that new system. So you have to have a system that is differentiated enough um, and provides enough value that people want to uh, mine it or participate in the consensus algorithm through proof of stake or whatever other algorithm you have uh, to provide security for that altcoin or altchain. Or do you instead try to build it as a layer on top of Bitcoin or merged mine with Bitcoin or perhaps as a side chain to Bitcoin or some other mechanism that ties it to Bitcoin in order to take advantage of the security of Bitcoin? And then is that a good solution? Does it give you the kind of security and validation that you need uh, for the particular application that you're trying to build? And, and we've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of coins make that fundamental decision and come uh, out with one side or the other side, or trying to find different approaches to um, either building their own security or leveraging the security of Bitcoin um, and finding solutions. And, and many of these have failed uh, to do so. Um, classic example, for, for example, is a Namecoin. Uh, and Namecoin um, started as a, as a separate chain. Uh, it also did merged mining with Bitcoin, but um, over time it became quite obvious that it didn't have sufficient security to support it from a security perspective. And now many of the systems that were built on top of Namecoin have abandoned it um, because the concentration of mining in, in Namecoin was such that um, it was more than easy to do a 51% attack. So um, you know, in this particular case, it seems, at least at first glance, that Namecoin failed to deliver enough independent security to justify having a separate chain. Uh, the first iteration of Counterparty delivered some useful features. We saw the same thing with Colored Coins and Mastercoin, which is now named Omni, and, and a number of different platforms that built on top of Bitcoin. Uh, and what these platforms were able to do is leverage the security of Bitcoin and not have their own chain. However, in order to do that, they pay a price. Uh, and the price is that they have less independence from the underlying mechanism of Bitcoin, and they don't necessarily have validation of their security. So when, for example, you're running a counterparty transaction or an Omni transaction or a colored coins transaction through the Bitcoin consensus mechanism, that transaction will be validated by miners based on the Bitcoin transaction validation consensus rules. Um, and these rules do not know anything about counterparty or Omni or colored coins. Therefore, they'll look at this and say, is it valid as a Bitcoin transaction? You know, maybe it has an op return for carrying data in it, and the validation of that will only be as much as validating that it is uh, a correctly uh, phrased op return with a correct uh, 
amount of data in it and it doesn't exceed certain parameters. But what that contains and what that means in the counterparty language or in a proof of existence document or in Omni or in a colored coin system, um, Bitcoin miners don't know, don't care, and don't validate, which means that while you're getting security for the basic underpinning of the mechanism to ensure, um, for example, um, the uh, immutability of recording things on the blockchain, you get that advantage. You get certain advantages around the transactions being atomic and not being able to, to do double spends and things like that. You get the transaction validation rules of Bitcoin. You don't get um, transaction validation rules extending to these new things. So, for example, let's say you have a proof of existence document notarization. Is there any way to test and make sure that that op return notarization stamp has not been used before? Uh, no, because that's not part of the transaction validation rules of Bitcoin. So nobody's validating that. Um, so this is essentially the, the challenge between these various platforms. If you build separately from Bitcoin, you have to differentiate strongly enough with enough value to bootstrap a security mechanism. So far, only a few coins have managed to do that, and for only very short periods of time. Uh, Ethereum um, now appears to have uh, uh, some security support through mining, that is getting more and more robust, and its value is justifying uh, an exponential increase in mining, which looks like it's bootstrapping enough security to support itself. Uh, and if it continues at this pace, it, it will be able to have uh, an independent amount of security that's sufficient until it gets to proof of stake. Um, but you know that's an exception. Most of the other coins and chains have failed to bootstrap uh, enough interest in order to have strong enough security, and uh, this becomes a conundrum. So platforms like the next generation of Counterparty and Rootstock have to make that same choice, uh, and they're choosing to make the choice in a different way. They're saying rather than have um, the independence that you get from Ethereum, we want to get the security robustness that comes from writing on top of Bitcoin's chain, uh, and it's better to do it in a chain that's already widely supported. Uh, whether that is a good choice or not, only time will tell. Uh, but it's certainly a different choice, and uh, you know it explores a different avenue for uh, delivering the same smart contracts functionality. Jeremy asks, "Hey Andreas, do you buy in Dash Core Dev's vision, where Bitcoin would be used only as a large transaction and high-value settlement system, and Dash instead be used for instant transactions and enhanced anonymity, or do you believe Bitcoin will still also be used to buy a cup of coffee and be able to act properly in any scenario, perhaps through Lightning Network?" Um, that is a great question. We don't know the answer to that. Um, I think Dash has uh, got some interesting innovations in it. Um, it has an interesting node reward system and voting system that may provide some additional governance. Whether that is strong enough differentiation and significant enough value to overcome uh, the advantages that Bitcoin has as a broadly deployed platform with many, many users and a very large capitalization and security infrastructure is something that we will not have answered for years. We'll see. Um, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Again, um, the same question that uh, leads Dash developers to make a separate chain is the question that other people have to ask themselves when they're building applications. Is it better to build that application on something like Dash, or is it better to build a separate chain, or is it better to build it on top of Bitcoin? Um, Lightning Network is one uh, example of where a system is being built on top of Bitcoin to do some, but not all of the things that Dash can do. Um, and then the question is, does that is that good enough? Because in many cases with technology, what wins is not the best, but the thing that achieves good enough, early enough, and at mass adoption scale, uh, or at significant uh, scale. So Bitcoin may not be the best solution, 
but it is the one that was good enough early enough uh, and has achieved very large scale at being good enough. And maybe if it takes some of the capabilities of other systems and implements them in a way that is good enough, uh, that continues to sustain advantage. Um, so I'm I'm not really um, taking a stand for or against. I think it's uh, up to the market to decide which solution is better at delivering on its promises. And there's many more questions um, to answer that beyond is it the best technology. Uh, because a lot of other parameters play into that. I will say, however, that the idea that um, Dash and uh, Ethereum and some of these other platforms uh, don't have or have solved the scaling problems of uh, Bitcoin or the governance problems of uh, Bitcoin. I think that idea um, is, if, it, if taken absolutely, is naive. Um, the, the truth is that uh, scaling problems uh, arise as you scale, and uh, when you solve them and scale again, then different scaling problems arise and continue to arise. And depending on the uh, choices you make to solve these scaling problems, different problems may arise in the future. So um, for something for some things that don't yet have market scale or um, value scale or user scale. Uh, to say that they have solved scaling problems um, is, is an untested and untestable hypothesis at the moment. Uh, it's a bit like saying um, my seven-year-old uh, in their high school football game has now scored uh, more goals uh, than um, you know Ronaldinho, uh, and therefore uh, Brazil should replace Ronaldinho in the next FIFA rounds with my seven-year-old. Uh, because uh, clearly they're doing better. Um, and and th that's not to say that the seven-year-old won't become a great soccer player. It's just to say that the comparison isn't suitable because uh, we're playing in different leagues here. And so the, the bottom line is that Bitcoin has scaling problems uh, because Bitcoin has scale. And when it solves these scaling problems, it will have new scaling problems at a different scale. Um, Ethereum uh, will also face scaling problems, and Dash will face scaling problems. Maybe the same, maybe different scaling problems than Bitcoin. They will also face governance problems. Maybe the same, maybe different governance problems, and they'll maybe come up with different solutions. Uh, the idea that they won't have any scaling problems or governance problems, I think, is naive. So, uh, in general. Um, I find all of the systems that are uh, competing and have come up as successors to Bitcoin very interesting. They're great for experimenting with new capabilities. Um, I, I think it is premature to declare Bitcoin dead again and say that it will be vanquished by the new kid on the block. Uh, we've heard that many times before. Um, if you've been in Bitcoin, you keep hearing that every three months with every new competitor. Um, and uh, I think it's it's important to realize that this is a very big space with a lot of differentiation, and different coins and chains will fit into different niches. They don't necessarily compete head on, uh, and even if they do, it's very difficult to uh, win against the network effect and early mover advantage that Bitcoin has. However, if they do, great. Um, you know that simply means that they made better choices. And uh, I, I'm always happy to change my opinion as new facts come to light. Let's see. Let's see if we have any questions from the forums yet. I don't see any. Let's pick one more question from the previous week. Lori asks, can you please uh, give us your opinion on the pros and cons of proof of work versus proof of stake? It seems that the industry is moving toward a hybrid. Do you think Bitcoin will follow? And if so, does this require a hard fork in the Bitcoin blockchain? Which of the above does Ethereum use? So, um, 
proof of work and proof of stake are not one thing. Uh, there are many things. There are many proof of work algorithms. There are many proof of stake algorithms, and they're not all the same. We're looking now at a space that didn't exist in 2008 and uh, is now rapidly developing with a lot of research. Uh, proof of work was the original invention. Uh, since then, people uh, invented a number of variants of proof of work, uh, including, uh, for example, variants based on different hashing algorithms. Ethereum uses a SHA-3 uh, based variant of proof of work at the moment for the Homestead uh, release. Um, uh, Litecoin, for example, used a uh, or uses a script-based um, variant of uh, proof of work, which is more memory hard and less uh, CPU hard, which makes it a bit less adaptable to ASICs, at least in the early stage. Um, and um, many, many uh, different alts uh, have experimented with a variety of proof of work algorithms. Uh, we've also seen a lot of exp experimentation with proof of stake, from a simple and straightforward proof of stake, where uh, coins are locked up uh, during a, a period of uh, some blocks, and then uh, fees are earned based on uh, staking coins against validation of the consensus rules. We've seen a delegated proof of stake um, and various variants of that. Uh, and we're still seeing a lot of development in these areas. We've also seen a number of alts that use hybrid systems, either bootstrapping the currency with proof of work and then transitioning to proof of stake, um, or simultaneously running proof of work and proof of stake um, in two different layers within the alt. And I think we're going to continue seeing a lot of experimentation. Ethereum is currently using a SHA-3 based proof of work system, and the plan is um, to transition that with the Serenity release, uh, which is scheduled for some time in the next two years without any um, fixed date at the moment, because it's, it's a moving target. Um, and during the Serenity release, it's intended for Ethereum to transition fully from proof of work to proof of stake, not to a hybrid, uh, but switching over completely to proof of stake. At least that's my understanding. Um, we'll see how that works out. Interestingly, um, to answer your question, do you think Bitcoin will follow? And if so, does this require a hard fork in the Bitcoin blockchain? Uh, no, it does not require a hard fork. It requires a series of soft forks. These soft forks have already happened as part of SegNet 4, which is the fourth iteration of the segregated witness testnet. Um, and these uh, soft forks enable um, segregated witness for protection against malleability, as well as um, relative uh, transaction lock time, check lock time, and check sequence verify, and a few other small tweaks, all of which give the possibility of running Lightning Network on top of Bitcoin. And here's the bombshell. Are you ready for it? Lightning Network is a proof of stake system. Uh, and by implementing Lightning Network on top of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin will become, probably before the end of this year, um, at least in testing, but possibly in production by the end of the year, uh, Bitcoin will become a hybrid proof-of-work, proof-of-stake system with the implementation of Lightning. Why do I call Lightning a, a proof-of-stake system? Because uh, Lightning involves tying together multiple payment channels um, that are used to route Bitcoin transactions, unsigned Bitcoin transactions, sorry, signed but unconfirmed Bitcoin transactions uh, off-chain that are used to do micropayments in a routed network. In order to do these payment channels, you have to commit funds to a multi-sig. And these funds, uh, once committed, specify the upper bound of the total amount of value that could be transmitted one way through the channel. Meaning that if you commit one Bitcoin to the channel, um, you can only send up to one Bitcoin in total transactions before you either have to fund the channel more or close it and reopen a new channel uh, with a different amount. Um, if uh, Lightning Network nodes are acting as intermediaries for other payment channels and routing transactions through them, uh, with uh, their own payment channels uh, between two parties, uh, then by committing funds into these payment channels, they're able to earn fees. 
that means that they will have to stake funds on the validation of payment channel transactions and based on that staking of funds they can receive fees that are determined as an upper bound by the amount of funds they stake that is a proof of stake system um, and so lightning effectively becomes bitcoins hybrid proof of stake system add-on uh, that can be added not just to bitcoin um, lightning can be added to any system uh, that can do validation with a few of the components in the scripting language that can allow for um, lock, uh, lock time, relative lock time, uh, and hash lock time contracts, as they're known. Um, and these uh, these capabilities now are exist in Bitcoin and in, in testing and are being rolled out um, as a soft fork in the very near future as part of the segregated witness and uh, check sequence verify soft forks. But any coin or currency or chain that implements these features can then implement Lightning Network on top uh, as a capability and therefore can add a proof of stake system on top of its existing proof of work or proof of stake system. The industry is moving towards hybrids uh, and Bitcoin by the end of this year, at least in testing, will very likely be a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake system. And it is funny because nobody yet has uh, noticed this is happening. Lori also asks, to a slight change of topics from proof of stake and alternative chains, in the course materials under private blockchain section, there's a mention of R3, and it ends with the following question. Could these new ledger networks help these organizations decrease costs and increase security? Uh, I have seen, says Lori, that R3 has completed their first trial and would like to know your opinion of, one, what will be R3's next activities in 2016, 2017? Two, is this something that could replace or complement SWIFT? Uh, great question, Lori. So as far as what will be R3's next activities in 2016, 2017, um, I don't know. I can't answer that directly. However, I can tell you um, the answer that I heard to this question by um, Mike Hearn, who's one of the people working at, at R3, um, who delivered the presentation at a conference I was at recently, and he said that the official, uh, and this seems to be the official position of R3, that R3 is currently in problem finding mode, meaning they're trying to identify which problems might be solved within the financial services industry with technologies like distributed ledgers. Um, so not even solution finding yet, problem finding mode. Uh, so what are there going to be their next activities? Uh, I don't know, probably more trials and testing. To your second question, is this something that could replace or complement uh, SWIFT? Um, it's, it's always been my opinion that while uh, Bitcoin seems to be disrupting banks, uh, banks want to disrupt their own banks, the banks' banks, uh, which are the settlement houses and clearance houses and uh, wire transfer networks. Uh, between banks, there, there are centralized positions of control that are occupied by these uh, quasi-private, quasi-governmental uh, entities like SWIFT, uh, the Depository Trust and Clearing uh, Company, and, and, a, and a whole number of others. There's probably two dozen other uh, major global clearinghouses and payment systems. And these systems uh, are intermediaries between banks, and they are points of centralization within the banking system, and these points of centralization attract uh, corruption and control and power in a way that is uncomfortable for banks. It means that these systems charge high fees uh, for solutions that are often slow and uh, not very accurate, as well as they can, and um, in my opinion, have and will continue to uh, provide preferential treatment to some of their customers, um, whether that's because of geopolitical concerns, nationalistic concerns, or simply profit concerns, uh, whether it's front-running transactions, giving uh, information faster, or simply allowing or not allowing participants to join into their networks. Um, all of these systems um, have power because of centralization. And so banks want to disintermediate them just as many of us want to disintermediate some of the banks. Um, and for those reasons, 
these ledger systems, these distributed ledgers may provide uh, mechanisms to take centralized positions within the clearance networks and replace them with slightly decentralized, not fully decentralized, not even close, slightly decentralized. Instead of having one clearinghouse, maybe five banks um, signing blocks for a distributed ledger that allows them to do clearance of equities or do uh, interbank wire transfers without relying on a central third party. This is the idea. I think it's one of the um, goals and one of the problems that potentially these ledgers would solve. There are many questions as to whether ledgers are good solutions for this. By uh, not implementing proof-of-work consensus in a decentralized and anonymous manner as Bitcoin does, uh, these distributed ledgers that are not Bitcoin um, have a very different security model. Uh, in fact, uh, for example, without proof-of-work, um, ledgers are not immutable. You can go back and rewrite them. It's important to understand, for example, that even if you had a consensus attack on Bitcoin, a 51% attack, um, that gave control over mining to a small minority and centralized mining, uh, because of the existence of proof-of-work, the miners still have to prove work. Um, even if it's under centralized control, and they they may be able to select transactions and deselect other transactions, but they still have to provide proof of work, which means that they can't rewrite blocks in the past without providing proof of work. Um, and because of the amount of proof of work that has accumulated, um, blocks beyond uh, even just a few dozen, let alone a day, 144 blocks in a day or a week or a month, are immutable. Uh, there is no way, really, um, practically speaking, to provide the proof of work to rewrite blocks more than a, a very shallow window into the past. This feature, immutability, which is critical to Bitcoin and one of the great features in Bitcoin, doesn't exist in a private ledger that has decentralized signing, um, for the simple reason that if there's no work required to sign, um, then essentially the banks can collaborate and go back and re-sign blocks in the past or rewrite the ledger. Uh, it will be detected, but it still is possible, whereas with Bitcoin it is impossible practically. So um, whether these public uh, sorry, whether these private ledgers will solve this particular problem of clearing equities or bonds or uh, wire transfers or checks or whatever else might be used by clearing houses, we don't know yet. Uh, Good luck to them. Um, I find this space uh, less interesting um, because these ledgers are by definition closed. Uh, they are controlled by a single jurisdiction and a group of com companies. They're centralized. They're not borderless. They're not open. Uh, they're not censorship proof. Uh, they don't allow open access. They don't allow open innovation uh, or permissionless innovation, as we would say. And so if Bitcoin is the internet of money, uh, these private ledgers are the intranets of money, which is useful for corporate intranet is very useful. Um, but what's much more interesting and much more useful is the internet of money. And um, so I'm not really working much in this space. Let's see, what else do I have here? Okay. I think I've answered almost all the questions. Let's go to a question by Don. Um, and and um, I have to say, Don and Auden and Lori, uh, Timothy, Jeremy, and all of the other regular contributors. There are some names that keep repeating. Alejandro as well. Sorry. Um, you know, someone sent me a thank you for putting up with their questions. And uh, no, you've got it wrong. Thank you. Um, giving me great questions week after week after week and participating in this way. Uh, there's five or six, maybe 10 people who have contributed the vast majority of the questions um, and who diligently contribute every week. And, and that gives tremendous value to this course. So thank you for doing it week in and week out. Let's go to Don's question. What do you think of Microsoft's announcement at its Build Developer event last week about Ethereum being included in Visual Studio? Is it a huge thing for a cryptocurrency to have the backing of Microsoft? Is it a last millennium dinosaur jumping on the cryptocurrency bandwagon? I love the phrasing of that. Um, 
Do you wish Microsoft had backed Bitcoin similarly in the early days? Do you think it's a good thing they didn't? I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, I think any time you have a large company uh, that has, more importantly, a very large ecosystem of developers um, participating in a technology, I think that's great. It brings more developers, and it just doesn't. It doesn't just bring more developers to Ethereum. Um, or more developers to Bitcoin, or it brings more developers to uh, decentralized cryptocurrency software development and blockchain development. It teaches them the essentials of blockchains, and then what they developed for these blockchains and which blockchain they choose to develop is not a question that's um, a, a, a religious litmus test or a favorite football team test or something like that. Uh, all of these blockchains have specific contexts and applications where they're best suited. Um, just like it's like saying, well, do you think Python or JavaScript will win if Microsoft backs Python and not JavaScript or JavaScript and not Python or whatever? Well, it depends. Are you writing front end or are you writing system software? Um, are you writing integration code or are you are you writing uh, user interface code? Because um, if you're writing user interface or front-end codes, you're going to use JavaScript. And if you're writing systems integration or um, back-end code, then you're going to use Python. You know, you use the tool that's suitable for what you're doing. So, is it good that Microsoft brought uh, attention to Ethereum? It's fantastic. Um, and the developers who are trained in this will learn how blockchains work and how decentralized consensus works and how the libraries for these things work and how the basic cryptography of signing and elliptic curves, um, hashing and, and blockchain hashes and Merkle trees and all of these technologies, how they work because they're present in all of these systems. Uh, and when they learn those, well, if they want to do smart contracts, they'll work on Ethereum. And if they, if perhaps if they want to use something that has a very broad currency support and is um, is uh, distributed among many platforms and has different applications with very robust security, maybe they'll use Bitcoin. Um, or if they want something that's very strong in anonymity at the moment, maybe they'll use Dash. Uh, and if they want something that has a really fun, great community, maybe they'll use Doge. Who knows? Um, it's it's not this is not a matter for uh, competition where Microsoft should have backed one versus another. Uh, I think in this particular case, given Microsoft's development interests, Ethereum is is a more logical choice because um, they are more likely to be developing smart contracts than they are to be interested in the applications of an open, borderless, highly secure, robust currency mechanism. Um, that uh, can provide a very, very strong immutable ledger. Uh, those types of applications are better suited for Bitcoin. And really, I don't know that Microsoft has those kinds of applications in mind. Um, maybe other companies do. So we'll see. Um, I'm very glad that we're beginning to see the tech community investing money and teaching people how to use blockchains, because I think that benefits all blockchains. Alden asks, can you talk a little bit about the security model with sidechains? No, oh, pardon me. I realized I'm not plugged in here. Hang on, my laptop is gonna stop working. Let me just plug it in. All right, and we're back. Whew, caught that just in time. Can you talk a little bit about the security model within sidechains? asks Auden. Will there be a need for miners to dedicate proof of work to a sidechain? And if so, what is the incentive? How will miners get rewarded for their work? So sidechains um, still an experimental feature, haven't been deployed in full. A sidechain is a two-way peg between two chains. What it allows you to do is lock with a proof some coins on one chain, and then using that proof, unlock coins um, on another chain. Um, and vice versa, then you can lock, uh, that's why it's called a two-way peg. You can then lock coins on the second chain and then unlock coins on the first chain. Uh, with a sidechain system, it's not one dominant chain and one small chain. It's, it's basically two chains side by side. In their function, because of a two-way peg, they are equal, they are peers. And so they both have security characteristics and they both have 
uh, a coin or token on them. Um, and the, the, the sidechain technology simply allows you to do uh, an atomic cross-chain swap. Atomic, meaning that it's all or nothing. It either happens or it doesn't. There's no way for things to get stuck in between or to do, do a half transaction. Um, Cross-chain, because it happens across two chains, and swap, because you're swapping one currency for another or one token for another. Um, now, keep in mind when you're doing side chains, who swaps the currency in and who swaps the currency out doesn't really matter. So, I could, um, let's say we're doing Ethereum as a side chain with Bitcoin. I could take um, 10 Bitcoin and swap it for um, 40 Ethereum, um, and uh, or rather one Bitcoin and swap, swap it for 40 Ethereum uh, in the Ethereum chain. Um, and where would I get my Ethereum? It would be mined on the Ethereum chain. When, so if I'm swapping one Bitcoin for 40 Ether, the Ether I get on the Ethereum chain is because it's mined or created through proof of stake or whatever consensus mechanism it has. It's secured on the, on the Ethereum chain by whatever consensus mechanism Ethereum has, including mining, and the creation of new coins, or proof of stake, or proof of work, or whatever it might be. Um, and then I do transactions with that Ether. Um, and then somebody else can then lock up Ether and take out Bitcoin that I locked up um, previously in exchange for that Ether. Um, so I, I don't have to go back on the peg myself. I could just stay on the Ether side, which means that there's liquidity of the tokens on both sides of the chain. And at any point in time, there will be a number of tokens locked in one chain um, that are unlocked tokens in the other chain, and vice versa. Um, and as long as there's always a fixed equivalent, so that if I lock one here, I unlock one there, and vice versa. Uh, that's how you maintain a two-way peg between the two uh, tokens. Now, the exact details haven't been worked out yet. How it will work in practice hasn't been worked out yet. But you should think of it, really, I think the, the best way to think about sidechains is as a completely decentralized, programmable version of a, a multi-currency exchange like Shapeshift. Um, so think of the way Shapeshift works, where you can send Bitcoin to an address and then receive Ether in return, or vice versa. Um, and at any point in time, what that's doing is it's doing an atomic uh, swap between a party that wants Bitcoin and a party that wants Ether that are swapping the two currencies. And these swaps um, are done through, at the moment, a centralized provider. But sidechains essentially allows you to do that uh, between two chains without a provider in a completely decentralized and trustless way. Um, so um, will there be a need for miners to dedicate proof of work to a sidechain? Yes, because you need to both generate and secure the token on the other chain. Um, and what is the incentive? They get rewarded by the token on that chain. Uh, the only difference is now they can also exchange that token for a token on another chain, the side chain, uh, in an atomic cross-chain swap. And the last, uh, oh, hang on, we have a question from the live session. Um, Don asks, is the ability to do a 51% attack really a major issue in, say, Namecoin? If the party doing the merged mining doesn't care one way or the other, isn't interested in censoring or mining in a special non-compliant way from a user's point of view. Um, if you could prove that there was no interest in uh, doing that, then sure. But what you're saying there, Don, from an economics perspective is, um, it doesn't matter because the thing we're doing is worthless. And that only applies as long as the thing you're doing is worthless. Because if it's not worthless, if it's worth something, um, the acquisition and registration of a name, for example, is worth something to someone, then they have incentives to influence or um, uh, reward a, a miner who's doing merge mining to, to, to use that power to exert influence over the thing that you say uh, that you that has value. 
Um, so as long as the thing you're doing is it has no value, then you don't need to worry about someone exploiting it. But um, obviously the concern here is that um, the consensus mechanism works because even when the thing has uh, tremendous value, the incentives to play by the consensus rules are greater than the value that can be achieved by breaking the consensus rules. And that's the game theoretical balance that exists in consensus algorithms. So when you're doing merged mining with another with another coin, um, you know if you could if you could do things on one coin only uh, that give you an advantage uh, by breaking the consensus rules, and the value you got was greater than the effort you put in mining, then that's a problem. Uh, and so the the theoretical possibility that they're not interested or don't care about what's going on in, in Namecoin only applies as long as Namecoin doesn't have any value. Um, and I'm not talking about value as a currency, I'm talking about value in terms of utility and application. So let's say Namecoin was part of the global DNS. Um, maybe Namecoins themselves for registration have no intrinsic value. Uh, but I guarantee you that if you have the domain sex.com, it has a lot of value and a lot of people want it. So um, therefore, you will have conflict, you will have dispute, you will have attacks trying to exploit weaknesses in the system, um, and you will have security considerations. And once you have security considerations, you can't depend on a consensus algorithm that isn't um, robust. So, um, yeah, it does matter. All right, and uh, last question for the day to wrap up. Odin asks, and this is completely off topic, but I'll entertain it just for fun. Do you believe in the existence of trolls who are simultaneously spreading conspiracy theories on both sides of the block size debate, with the goal of dividing the community by making the debate as dirty as possible? And if these trolls really exist, how can we fight them? Um, I'm going to take this question simply because uh, I think it's important to understand that whenever you have something that is valuable, and that valuable thing um, threatens the interests of uh, very large financial systems, uh, then uh, the idea that uh, people will deliberately pay uh, other people to create uh, dissent and disunity and disruption and noise, um, well, we have seen this happen in history, throughout history, as a tactic of undermining uh, systems, communities, political parties, factions, uh, labor union movements, ecological movements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a tactic that has been used um, and is as old as uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War and Nicola Machiavelli's The Prince. Um, these are not new tactics. Uh, they are extremely successful. And they are used, especially in areas where uh, you have democratic uh, governments that cannot apply uh, brute violence uh, without consequences and need to use more subtle techniques of manipulation um, and disruption. And so uh, we have seen that democratic governments, uh, corporations, intelligence agencies, uh, police agencies, political parties apply these tactics again and again and again and again throughout history. And especially with the internet, we have seen that these tactics have increased, gained value. And we've seen many, many examples of organizations using these tactics to divide and disrupt communities. So the idea that this is not happening in Bitcoin is more implausible to me uh, that somehow when these tactics are being used broadly across many communities by many, many different parties, uh, somehow Bitcoin is the one place where they won't be used, despite the fact that um, what we're doing in this space, in the cryptocurrency space in general, uh, has the possibility of disrupting some major financial interests. So yes, some of the people disrupting this community um, are paid. Uh, are paid shills. Their job is to cause disruption. Um, but that doesn't mean that all of them are, or even a majority are. Uh, many of them are just idiots. Uh, many of them are just responding to uh, human emotions and tribalism and uh, strong opinions and uh, anger. 
um, and are not being paid. They do this entirely for free as amateur trolls. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean they're on to also uh, paid shills who are trying to disrupt us. Uh, what do you do and how do you fight this? You focus on the technology. You ignore the noise. You don't feed the trolls. Uh, you pay attention to the real innovations that are happening. You cut through the noise. You don't get panicked and fearful about all of this um, drama. And just remind yourself that this is a very large, very diverse community with great, interesting, enthusiastic, and motivated people inventing amazing technologies every day. And none of that noise matters because what we're building is real and it's useful. So with that, uh, I would like to end this session. Uh, thank you for joining me for this massive open online course for the master's degree in digital currencies for the University of Nicosia. I've been your host, Andreas Antonopoulos, and don't forget uh, to make this great quality content. Uh, please submit questions in advance um, in the forums. Give us an opportunity to prepare some great answers for you. And we will see you for the next session. Live session is April 8th with Antonis Polamitis at um, noon Eastern Daylight Time, 1700 or 5 p.m. British Standard Time, 1900 or 7 p.m. Eastern European Standard Time. Uh, that's all for me for this session. I will see you for the next iteration of this. Thank you so much for uh, participating in this MOOC and for all of your great questions. Have a good one.